river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. pray this morning that the Holy, the Spirit of the Holy One would come down. We pray, Lord, for manna from heaven today, God. We recognize, Lord, that without you we can do nothing. And we, Lord, be worse than nothing without you. I pray, God, today that the Word of God will minister to the hearts and the spirits and the souls of these people today and their minds. And, Lord, that where strengthening needs to be, it'll happen. Where courage needs to come, that'll happen. Where comfort needs to come, that'll happen. But Lord, above all of our needs, we pray that we might glorify you. And I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you will be glorified through this worship service today as we preach your word and gather around your table. Lord, I pray, help us to aggravate the devil today. And I pray, God, today folks will be saved. 
before it's eternally too late. Oh God, save the lost, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles to the book of Ruth this morning. If you guys would care to put up on the wall, there's two things I want. Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And then Romans chapter 8 and about verse number 27 right in there through the rest of the chapter. I'd appreciate that. I'd appreciate that. You're turning to the book of Ruth chapter 2. There was a pastor and his daughter were in a large city and they were passing out tracts and he was giving the gospel to people that would come by. He was talking to people, giving out tracts and so forth. And they'd been out there a little over an hour and lo and behold, a police car pulled up. Two policemen got out of the car walked over to him and said, sir, we're going to take you down to the station. And he said, what for? And they said, you're violating city ordinances. And they put handcuffs on him, put him in the police car while the daughter watched and drove him down to the police station. And I'm going to tell you the finishing of this story a little bit later on, but I'm going to say this to you, that in the end, he said this, he thanked God for his arrest. After it was all done, he said, I thank God for my arrest. I want you just to kind of keep that thought in mind as we read the book of Ruth, chapter 2, one of the greatest books in the Bible. They're all great, but my goodness, this is one of my favorites. Uh, you know the story here uh, in the chapter 1 of Ruth. Uh, her uh, uh, her father-in-law, Abimelech, and, and Naomi, uh, there was a famine in the land of Israel, and they left out. And they went down into Mo to Moab, and uh, there, why, uh, Elimelech died. And then her daughters had gotten married, and their two, their two husbands died. So the husband and father died, and then the two son-in-laws died. And uh, so here's Naomi, and she's heading back. She heard that things were better in Israel, so she heads back to Israel. Now, I'm telling you, there's not a book in the Bible that's multi-layered, and has all kinds of biblical doctrine in it, like the book of Ruth. This, this book, you can read it all your life, study it, meditate. You'll never get to the bottom of it. And it's one of the books that will enrich your life of faith more than any, as any much or more than any book in the Bible. Now, when you get into chapter 2, uh, uh, you come down there. It says that and Naomi there. Now, they're back in the land. And, of course, uh, Orpha, she said, I'll go with you. But in the end, she didn't. And uh, Ruth claved to her, the Bible said. Then chapter 2, they're back in the land of Naomi. Uh, this woman who's been widowed, whose two sons had died, and now she's back in the land with this one daughter-in-law, had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. I've named all my kids, and I, as far as I know, Karen, I doubt if Karen and I has any more kids. We might. You can't ever tell. But anyway, <laughs> that'd be a shocker. Amen. Uh, you should have seen my, eye, my wife's eyes roll. <laughs> but uh, well, we're enjoying our grandchildren. Amen. They're a blast. I tell you what, you can send them rascals home and everything else. But boy, boy grandkids are a blast. And I know now why they call them grand. I'm, I used to hear people say that, and I flopped it off. Boy, I tell you what, it's a blessing to be able to send them home. Amen. Anyway, <laughs> no, I tell you what, we've got some of them with us a lot of the time, and we're enjoying that. But uh, anyway, uh, Lee, I've, I've wondered why people don't name, but if I had another boy, I'd either name him Elijah or Boaz. Boaz is one of the greatest men in the Bible. I wonder why people have, don't name their children Boaz. And one of the greatest men of the Bible is named Boaz. Now, so I don't know, maybe we'll get a Boaz one day here in this church, amen? <clears throat> well, I guarantee you one thing, that's a good name to name him. And uh, so anyway, I mean, just a little thought there. Verse number two, Ruth the Moabitess said, just a little thought. I just have little thoughts, by the way. I don't have big thoughts, just little thoughts, okay? And, and Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, now here's Ruth, and boy, what a woman she is. Uh, by the way, she's a descendant, you know, of, of Lot's incestuous situation. Uh, you know, there's something to learn there. It don't matter about your background. It don't matter where your family came from. It's where you're going, Amen. Oh, Clint, we're glad to see you in church today. Amen. Bless your heart. I tell you, you stay right in there. Amen. Now, you milk this for all it's worth. You get your wife to work all the, you know, you, uh, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. All right. But it is good to see you. We're glad you're up and about. And uh, anyway, uh, so it, Ruth, this Moabite, said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. Now, she had heard about this Boaz. And, uh, and so, hey, let's go down there and see if we glean ears. And that was a, a law back in Leviticus about the gleaning that they had. That was God's uh, welfare program. You can't improve upon it. It's the best there is. If we did what they did, we wouldn't have near the mess we got in our country today. Amen. And uh, boy, I tell you what. Anyway, said uh, in whose sight I shall find grace. 
grace. Look at that word grace. And she said unto her, go my daughter. Now I want you to watch verse number three. This one I'm going to preach out of today. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap, I want you to underline or just do something to mark the little phrase, her hap. Her hap. Uh, little phrases in the Bible have big implications. Often in the Bible they say, but, boy, I'm telling you what that, I mean, there's great events, turns just upon that little old word. It said her hap was to light on the part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And, and we get this word, it happened. It, it just happened. I mean, it just kind of, it just happened. She just, just, just happened that she wound up being at Boaz's field. But that's not really, that's, our concept of that is humanistic. It's not biblical. Uh, we tend to think that because happenings happen, but there is a providential God over the happening. Amen. And things just don't happen. But her hap that God had ordained in his providence was that she would be in that man's field. What God is telling you, it wasn't an accident. What God is telling you that he orchestrated the events. Now, I want to tell you something right now. Not because I'm preaching it, but because this is one of the most important doctrines in the word of God that will keep you stable in your life. This will keep you out of the mental ward. This will keep you off of, uh, what they call them, pills. I'm trying to think. Nobody uses antidepressants. What I'm, I'm serious with you. You think I'm, I'm not kidding you. People do not know biblical truth and they're going nuts. Because they have a stable foundation of what is going on in this world. What's going on in my life. I want to ask you a question. Why was Stephen able to say to the people that were stoning him to death, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge? Why was Jesus able to say on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? The doctrine I'm going to preach to you today will tell you why those men, because they understood, not of course Christ, but Paul, why was Joseph able to say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good? It's because they understood this biblical truth that's been left out of American churches today. I'm serious with you. It's been left out of our theology, and we need to get it right back in. We have a, a town in America called Providence. Your forefathers so much believed in this doctrine that they even named a town after a city, Providence, Rhode Island. People used to talk about the providence of Almighty God, but nobody much talks about it. We have went way over here on this left side of saying the free will of man. It's all up to us. No, it's not all up to you. Now, hardly anything's up to you, if you don't know the truth about it. There is an overriding providence of God at work, and it was at work here in Ruth's life. There are several truths uh, in this story of Ruth. Uh, one of the truths is try to stay in the will of God. One of the things, Ruth, is a picture of the Gentiles being grafted into Christ. You study the 10-generation prophecy back over there. Uh, but you see the providence of God in this book, probably prominent more than anything else. Now, you say, Reggie, what are you talking about the providence of God? Things just don't happen. You ought to write that down on one of the white pages in the back here. Why do, the, why do they put them white pages on each end of your Bible so you write some few things down? Amen once in a while. Things just don't happen. That's the providence of God. Her hap. There's no poem that says things don't just happen to the children of God. They are part of his wonderful plan. Amen. The troubles, the reverses, the sorrows are work. Of our great sculptor's hand. Her hap. Now here's something you need to understand. It was unforeseen by her. She's coming up out of Moab. Ruth's here. They're walking up the road going back. She didn't see all this coming. She didn't know what was ahead of her. You don't know what's going on tomorrow. Both not in thyself of tomorrow. For thou knowest not what another day may bring forth. Glenn, I can guarantee you, you didn't know he's going to be up in the hospital. Chest cut wide open. I mean, you might have thought better, right? But you didn't really know that. We didn't know that Pearl's funeral would be tomorrow. We didn't know lots of things. We don't know nothing. But there's a providential God in heaven that does know. Amen. And the trick is, or not the trick, the, the wisdom is, is to start walking in and with and in agreement with the providence of God. You see, the providence of God was for Jonah to go to Nineveh. But Jonah said, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to put my will at work above your providence. That didn't work out too good. Let me just tell you something. Hey, uh, isn't there two ways? There's more than one way to Nineveh, right, sister? There's more than one way to Nineveh. You know what that means? There's the providence of God. It's going to happen. And there's more than one. You can go the hard way or you can go the easy way. 
The problem, that, can I tell you something? It's not just, it just didn't happen that you're at church this morning. I'm sorry to tell you, I'm telling you the truth. Providence of God. You listen online. Some of somebody will listen to this message three years from now. It won't be just a happenstance. It'll be the providence of God. I've had, I don't know how many people in the last 20 years say, Reggie, I, I was at a truck stop and I don't do that. I don't really do but I just saw that and I, I picked that CD up and I listened to it. And I'm telling you what, God got a hold of my life. God was behind the scenes. It just happened that that CD was there. It just happened that they walked by right at that moment. No, things don't just happen. There's a providential God in heaven. And I hope before we get done today that you can see that. Is there such a thing as chance? Or is it chance? Is, is it chance or is it providence? Was it chance that she married Elimelech? Was it just a chance that the famine came? Was it just a chance that they moved down to Moab? Was it just happened that her husband died? Was it just happened that uh, her sons died? Is these just things that just happened? It was just chance? It's just, well, it just this, it, these things just happened. Was it chance that she went back up with her mother and the other sister-in-law turned away? When you read this book, you'll understand that behind everything going on, whether you think it's bad, good, or ugly, there's a providential hand of God. Now, you listen to me this. There's some elementary, fundamental, foundational biblical truths you need to get down. Number one is that God Almighty does exist. Whether you understand that, see it or not, he does exist. Number two, he has revealed what he wants you and I to know in this book. And he created this world. And what you, one of the things you really need to get a hold of is that the fall, what we call the fall. That man sinned. And death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. That's why there's all this sin and misery and wickedness and stuff in the world because of the fall. And then you need to understand that man is depraved. Oh, listen, if you don't understand the depravity of man, you ain't, you ain't going to do too good in this life. You're going to be really messed up. Everybody around you is depraved. Fallen, depraved creatures. And apart from the righteousness and the influence of the gospel and righteousness of Jesus Christ, will do the awfulest things you've, beyond what you can nearly dream of. That's the fact of the matter. People are not generally speaking good. They're wicked. You get a hold of that. The only way, and man is separated from God by his sins. The only way you'll ever be reconciled is through God's ordained way. That's through the blood of Jesus Christ, that he died for you in your place, paid your sin, resurrected, died, resurrected from the dead. God only saves and it will ever save anybody through faith in that sacrifice and substitutionary death. That's the elementary foundational fact of the Bible. If you don't get those things, you'll, you'll constantly be thrown here and there. Now, first of all, the hand of God is behind the scenes of human history. I'm not real happy about what's going on in America right now. In fact, I'm frustrated, aggravated, ticked off. I don't like the lion. I don't like the constant perversion. I don't like the communistic garbage that I'm seeing going on in this country. We are seeing wickedness go on. But if I don't remember this doctrine, I will get into discouragement and despair and not be worth a flip nickel for nobody. And what God has done for me this week is said, Reggie, you have forgotten something. That I am a sovereign, providential God, and there is nothing happens in this world without my providential care over it. Again, I hope as we go through, but it wasn't just happenstance that she stayed with Naomi. It wasn't just happenstance that she went to that field. It wasn't just happenstance that Boaz said, who's that? All right. And it wasn't just happenstance that she met and married Boaz. And here's why I'm going to tell you why I know that. Because if you read the end of the book, you'll find out that she was divinely providentially brought into the lineage of Jesus Christ as a picture of the Gentiles being brought into Christ. And you read about her lineage as, as she goes through there. It was a providential act of God. And you cannot say, well, this part was providential, but that part wasn't. It's all providential. So you say, Reggie, what does that mean? That means that sometimes when people die, it's the providential will of God. It means when some bad things happen, it's the providential will of God. Now, let me just say something to you. You are not going to be able to wrap your brain around it, so don't even try. You have to accept this by faith. God has never not been involved in history. 
God never went on vacation and come back and said, oh, good land of living. Look what they're doing, the stupid idiots. God has never not been involved in history. God has never not been involved in nations. God has never been not involved in individual lives. And let me just say something to you today. Please get this. Please believe this. Reach out in faith this morning. God is providentially involved in your life. Every one of us. God is involved in history now. God's providence is still ruling. God is involved in your life and my life right now. He does not just wind up the clock of history and back off and let her run. Mm -mm. God is in control of history. Now, watch this. Within the framework of God's providence, there is such a thing as the respons personal responsibility of obedience to God, oftentimes called free will. But listen to me. Your free will that God has given you is not beyond and outside of the providence of God. I gave you Jonah a while ago. Jonah's will was to run the other way. But the providence of God said, no, you're not getting outside of your free will, Jonah, is not getting outside of my will. And God literally takes our perverted, corrupted free will and works all things together for good. Give you an instance. Was it just happening that Joseph's brothers hated him? That just happened? Did it just happen that he went, that his father said one day, Joseph, go down and check on your brethren? Did it just happen that he said, oh, there's that daddy's baby. Let's kill him. Did it just happen that one of the brothers said, no, let's don't kill him, but let's put him in the pit. Did it just happen that the Midianites came by right about that time? Did it just happen that they said, let's sell him? Did it just happen that the Midianites took him down and changed the, 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 to Egypt and that he was, uh, went through all that he went? What just happened? No, no, no. You cannot read his story without knowing that there's the providential hand of God at every move of his life. Did it just happen that in the book of Psalms tells you that Joseph was put in, in, in stocks and bonds? Did it just happen that we don't even know how many months or years that young man sat in prison with stocks and bonds? And what was he thinking? Is this the providential will of God for me to be here? If it is, I don't like the providential will of God. Our problem is that, that we want God to conform to our free will, but he is not going to do it because he is God. He doesn't have to, and he's not. One of the greatest days you'll ever have in your life when you say, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. And Lord, if that's a, can I just tell you something this morning, young people? Jesus Christ didn't live to be 93. He lived to be 33 years old and prime of his life out. The providence of Almighty God, of his offering as a sacrifice for sins, did not live a long, full life. But in the prime of his life, 33 years. But Jesus said, Father, not my will but thy will be done. Let me tell you, the secret is learning to live and accept. You want peace right here? You want peace right here? Get inside and agreed with and accept the providence of God in your life. That does not mean that everything is hunky-dory. It doesn't mean everything's going great. In fact, it may mean you're like Joseph. You've got a lot of problems. You've got people that hate your, watch me, hate your guts lie on you, cheat you, hurt you, do all kinds of garbage to you, but God is allowing it in his providential will. Now, I don't know what's going to happen to America in the next few days or the next few years, but I can tell you something that gives this buddy, gives this old boy solidity and peace and comfort and strength is knowing that Biden and the Democrat Party and all the liberals are not ahead of God. Amen. And they're not operating outside the providential power of God. Amen. Can I tell you something? Hitler came to power in 1933. Did it just happen? 
No. If you we, see what we couldn't see, what people couldn't see back then, what God was doing, but you and I are well able to look back and see. Did the Holocaust just happen? Was the gas chambers just happen? Do you know what God was doing? He was doing exactly what he prophesied doing, that he would cause his people to come back. Those Jewish people would have never wanted to come back to the land had not the Holocaust occurred. Heim Wiseman said, we have to have a land. Yes. 1947, 1948. Did it just happen that Harry Truman was a business par partner to, him, to, him, to Harry Jacobson up here in Kansas City, Missouri, a Jew? Well, did it just happen that Harry Truman was a senator? And then did it just happen that uh, they couldn't get together at the national conventions? And so they, a compromised candidate was a guy named Harry Truman? Did it just happen that Harry Truman became vice president and they said he's the dumbest guy in the country, but at least he's in the spot and he won't hurt nothing? <laughs> did it just happen that FDR died about four months after uh, Roosevelt's fourth election? Did it just happen that Harry Truman was the one sitting in the Oval Office when the state of Israel was going to be born? Did it just happen that everybody told him don't, make, don't recognize him as a state? Did it just happen that, that Eddie, Eddie Jacobson walked up to the White House and said, I'd like to see the president. Who are you? Just tell Harry, Harry that Eddie's here. Eddie Jacobson coming in. Harry Truman says, Eddie, what you doing here? Nobody comes here except they want something. Well, that ain't the, tr that ain't the truth. And he said, I want you to recognize Israel as a nation. And among all the opposition, God just happened Amen. to have had him in business with him up here in Kansas City, Missouri, decades before. No, it wasn't just happening. There's a providential hand of Almighty God that's moving. And oh, the joy! Oh, the joy of saying this morning in your heart, dear God, I'm not going to be bitter at you anymore. God, I'm not going to be mad anymore. God, I'm not going to be upset anymore because of God. You know what was wrong with Naomi? Look at chapter 1. I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. I'm mad at the providence of God. Look at verse number 20. And she said to them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Have you ever said that? The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Don't talk to me about being happy, being joy. God's dealt bad with me. Oh, really? That's our problem. That's why we're not happy. That's why we can't shout in church. That's why we can't rejoice. Because secretly we're sitting in church saying, God's been dealt, dealt me a bad hand in life. Can I tell you something this morning in this church? All across this church, there are people you're sitting close to that have got hurts and sorrows you know nothing about. And if you knew, you might think differently toward them. There have been people, there's people all over the church that have been hurt deeply in their lives. And they're just trying their best to accept the providence of God and get in the will and walk with Almighty God and accept His providence in their life. God just doesn't wind up the clock and step back and let it go. The hand of God was in Ruth's life. The hand of God is upon your life. Things weren't just happening. Now, there's a balance of truth, and I want to hit this again, lest somebody... Now, let me tell you something right now. Somebody says, oh, you're a Calvinist. Oh, you're an Armenian. I'm not either one. Quit letting people put you in a camp that you don't belong in. Amen? I don't want to be in the Calvinist camp, and I'm not. I don't want to be in the Armenian camp, and I'm not. I'm in the Bible camp. Amen? 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 Get over that junk. There is a balance. There is the sovereignty of God, the providence of God. But there is also the free will of man. But the free will of man works within the framework and the confines of the providence of God. And if you'll get that down, and when something bad happens in your life, I mean something terrible happens, and you're able to say, bless God, I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why. But in the providence of God, I'm going to accept it, and I'm not going to be bitter like Naomi was. I walked over this morning, shook Sid's hand, and Brother Kenny's dear family, and, you know, old Kenny, I just love old Kenny. And his brother-in-law, Troy, taken 48 years old, I don't understand it, Ty. I don't understand it. But I know in the providence of God that on the other side of eternity, we're going to look back and say, somehow... Some way it was in the providence of Almighty God. I don't like it. 
I don't like it. But I can accept it by faith and say, God, I, I don't like it. I don't like seeing the loneliness, the emptiness, the hurt, the pain, the absence. I'd like to be able to look over there this morning and see him sitting by his wife, enjoying his grandchildren. But dear friend, we're living in a fallen world where there's sin and death and sorrow. And I'm telling you something, I don't understand everything. But your forefathers would say, listen, don't get bitter at God. Don't get mad at God. Accept the providence of Almighty God. Brother Larry Brown, great preacher, been here many times. We were sitting up there, I preached for him up there in Iowa. And we're sitting out in his house. Beautiful 10-acre piece there, the big pond, and his wife and him had worked in the garden. Beautiful place there, just out in the country. Nothing fancy, just a beautiful place where their handprints was all over it. Sitting out there on the patio, a little fire pit, his wife sitting there, Diane, having the best visit in the world. Within two years, she's gone with brain cancer. He's given his life to Christ. I mean, he worked his guts out for Jesus. Traveled all over the world preaching the gospel. Had a church in a little cornfield town up there running 700 people for years. Started off with two couples. Gave his life. And then at the prime of their life when their kids are starting to get married and they're having grandchildren, the, the mother comes down with brain cancer. You can't explain that. What if Brother Larry says, okay, God, that's really good. We tried to serve you all these years and this is what happens. I'm done. If that's the kind of God you are. Uh-uh. Hard, yes. Difficult, understand it all, no. But there's a providential God in heaven. Your, your forefathers said this, we will understand it better by and by. Amen. Don't understand it now, but I still love God. I still believe that God's good, that God's righteous and holy and does what's right, and he has a right to whether I like it or not. I still trust the Lord with all of our life. There's a balance of that truth. But God's, man, man's will cannot step and stop the sovereignty of Almighty God. There are some things this morning that would help you. I'm going to give you a few of these. So you can get these out of the uh, advanced or out of the basic seminar, and Institute of Basic Life Principles, but he talks about some unchangeables in your life. Americans, oh, how America needs this. These are Bible principles. Number one, you can't change your physical characteristics. Jesus said, how, how many of you were just thinking can, you know, increase your stature? You don't do that. Oh, I know you may get them to pull on you with a rubber band to get you higher and taller, but that ain't, you're, you're just, you know what? God made you like he made you. Your, your physical characteristics, your height, your eyes, your hair color. I mean, I know you can do something, uh, you know, but still, you're still brunette. Amen. You're still what you are. I don't care what you did. and I, That's fine. Help yourself. But you can't really change that. I mean, you've got to keep putting it on to keep, right? Pretty soon something grows out that says, now my wife, believe it or not, that's natural. She is a brunette when I married her. Now, if she'd been gray like that, I'm not sure what would have happened. I don't know. <laughs> but God did it, amen. And you know what? I want to tell you ladies something. Not one time in my entire life has my wife, ever, she may have thought this, but I don't think so. She never said one time, I don't know why I have to be gray at such a young age for. It. I don't like the way God made me. I just, told, I just kept telling her it's pretty. You know, I, I'm, my wife, she hates me to mention her from the pulpit, Brother Maybe I mean, she hates it. I, I don't get to eat for three or four days when I mention her from the pulpit. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you the honest truth. I've always been thankful that she didn't, was, I didn't walk in the bathroom or somewhere and she's looking at me going, honey, what do you think about this color? Honey, what, you know what? One of the most beautiful things about my wife is she just accepts who she is, that God made her. You girls will do well to do that. Quit trying to be what Hollywood tells you you're supposed to look like. You know, my height, my nose, <laughs> my teeth. God made it. I didn't make it. If that's the way you want me to look. That's the way I'm going to look. Amen. You don't like it. That's your problem. Tell God about it. He made me. 
But I'm not going to spend my entire life going, well, I wish I looked like Clint. Or I wish I looked like Sid. Or I wish I looked like... I ain't doing that. In fact, I'm glad I don't look like nobody but myself. Amen. Wouldn't recognize me in the morning if I would. <laughs> Just be glad how God made you. Number two, you can't change your gender. You can't change that. That is the stupid, that, that's the stupidest out of hell bunch of junk I ever heard tell of in my life. But you know what we got today? We have 17 major cities in the United States which the public schools have instituted kindergarten gender training classes. 17 major cities have implemented in the school system, in the kindergarten classes, gender studies. So that if you don't th want to be a boy, you don't have to be a boy. I got news for you. That is, that's, that's the definition of insanity. That's insanity. Can I tell you something? If you're a guy, be happy you're a guy. If you're a girl, be happy you're a girl. Quit trying to be something God never made you to be. This country is, I, I don't know next, see, I was going to preach, it wasn't until last, yesterday afternoon I changed my whole message. I was going to preach today a nation of reprobation. I was mad. Come back next week, maybe the Lord will let me preach it. <laughs> but last afternoon, God just changed my whole deal. Said, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> but anyway, uh, boy, oh boy, man, I'm old. Anyway, you can't change your gender. Just be glad who you are, amen? You know, what's, you know what's really funny? These people all the time talk about science, science, science. Why don't you use science about your little gender issue? Now, you don't want to use science, DNA, stupid. Mm. You can't change your birth order. Well, I'm going, to be the first, I'm going to be the firstborn in my family. No, you're not. If you're thirdborn, you're thirdborn. If you're the little brother, you're the little brother. All right? I mean, quit worrying about it. Then there's your race. Amen? If you're Asian, Miss Queen, Miss Queen, how are you? Are you Asian? Are you happy about it? Good. I'm happy for you. You black? I'm glad for you. You're glad too. You better be glad because God made you. When are we going to get over this stupid junk? Uh, you know what I've heard some little high school boys say, oh, I wish I was black so I could play basketball. You stupid. <laughs> I got news for you. They ain't one out of 10 million black boys gets to play professional basketball. So you'd be black and working somewhere. One percent, one percent. All right, 99 percent. You can't change your race. God made you who you are. Don't you like it? Amen. And don't, work, and don't look down on somebody that ain't your race. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Uh, last I read, Jesus tasted death for every man. Amen. Last time I read, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right. Amen. Amen. Anyway, you can't change your parents. <laughs> I know. Well, you just don't know how my dad was. Yeah, you don't know how my dad was either. <laughs> He is the best dad in the world, amen. But I tell you what, he can whoop you so hard, so fast, make your head swim. And my mama was twice as quick. <laughs> you know, dad was really good. He'd go get a board. He'd make you cut a switch. Not mom. She'd grab you. I'd rather have a whooping with a switch right back here than have her knuckles on my head. Don't do that to your kids. That's why I ain't got no sense. She knocked it out. <laughs> She, she used to say, I'm going to knock some sense into you. No, no. She was knocking it out of me. Amen. <laughs> this week, I was in the House of Representatives there at Hannah's uh, uh, swearing in. And uh, they, because of COVID, you couldn't be in the auditorium whenever they did some of that stuff. And so anyway, we listened to the, the new Speaker of the House's speech uh, in her office through the Speaker. And so the Speaker is speaking through the Speaker. I just thought I'd throw that in, amen. And, uh, so anyway, but he's talking. I'm sitting there. You know, I'm kind of half in, half out. You know, but all of a sudden, I start picking up because he starts talking about this little boy. 
He said, there's a, he said one time there's a little boy, and he said uh, he, he got into school. He said before he was, I believe, before he was in, by the time he was eighth grade, he'd been in six different homes. And he said, I got into school, and he said, uh, he, he, said he said, that little boy got into school, said he, he didn't do no good, said he couldn't learn nothing. Said he, he said, no, it just kind of like just shove him off side because he just couldn't get stuff. And he said, one day he got up here about seventh grade, he's trying to teach him fractions. And he said, he's just absolutely just a wall, couldn't get it, nothing like that. But he said, there's a teacher who come in one day with a carpenter's tape and said, you're going to learn. Is that my phone? And he said, he brought in this tape and he said, you're going to learn fractions today. Put your math book aside. Put your math book in your desk. And he said, isn't your daddy a carpenter? He said, yeah, my daddy's a carpenter. Straighten me out, hand, if I get this wrong. He said, all right, does your daddy have one of these? Yeah, my daddy's got one of those. Do you use it much? Use it all the time. Oh, oh, he says, okay, here's one inch, two inches. You got that? Yeah, I got that. See that little mark right there? That's called half inch. That's 50% of that inch. See that little marker? That's quarter. Oh, I know all that. He says, then you, she, he said, you know fractions. You just don't know you know fractions. <laughs> Kids don't learn like. Your kids don't learn like. Some things they grab, some things they can't grab at all. And when, until America wakes up and realizes that and quit trying to funnel all our kids through the same head shoot. I mean, we're like a bunch of ranchers out here. Every cow in the herd is going to go through this head shoot. And there's kids going, <laughs> Amen. It's the truth. Thomas Edison was sent home too stupid to be in school. His mama homeschooled him. He thought in analogetic ways. Always an analogy. If you could show him an analogy, boom, it didn't turn out too bad. You, you're sitting in the lights. So I'm saying to you this, but anyway, story going on up there. He's in, in at least, what is it, six or seven different foster homes. But the first thing he said, watch this, the first thing he said was, the first thing I want to say today and thank the first person I want to thank. Now, he's Speaker of the Missouri House. Not a bad accomplishment. He says, I want to thank my birth mama for not aborting me. Amen. I want to thank her for birthing me and letting me live. And then he was in six or seven different foster homes over several years. And then finally, I think a family took him in at that right hand and permanently. And, uh, and they taught him about God. And he said, one of my main focuses of the time I've got here behind this lectern is I want the Missouri school children to have a chance at something besides being forced through a system. Yes. I want school choice in this country. Amen. Amen. You listen to me. I don't care what they're, what's going on in the news media. God is raising people up. Amen. That's right. Hey, listen. If God be for us, ain't nobody. I got to roll your time in history. Well, I wish I lived back in the days of Daniel Boone. Well, tough luck. You can't. You'd have probably been shot with an arrow anyway. You would nobody even know about you. <laughs> you can't change your brothers and sisters. Yeah, you got who you got. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to dwell on that long. <laughs> and you can't change aging and death. So you better get in line with God about it. You better get in the providential will of God about it. Nothing ever surprises God. But we often think, was it chance or was it choice? There was a, one of the framers of the Constitution on the night before the foundation of our, of our republic was laid out, what type of government we'd have just happened, now listen to this, to read Isaiah 33, 22. Just happened the night before. They were going to have this big deal about it. You know what it says there? The, our Lord is the judge, the Lord is the lawgiver, and the Lord is the king. Three branches of government, legislative, judicial, executive and he took that in the next day to the men that were meeting to found our government just happened George Washington was in battle before long, long before his presidency 
Virginia boy there and got two horses shot out from underneath him in this battle. Two horses shot out from underneath him. That evening when they went into the tent, he took his jacket off and bullets, spent bullets, fell out of his jacket. This used to be taught in school. is mandatory learning. And this is what George Washington and, and one of the men, one of the guys there said, uh, Mr. Washington, you, you've been shot out. Yeah, he said, I've several times today. But he said, none of those bullets were mine providentially by the hand of God. Amen. If God had wanted me dead, those bullets wouldn't be in my jacket. They'd be in my body. The man understood the providence of Almighty God. You and I need to accept the providence of God. Let me get personal right now. You may have been rejected by somebody for marriage or for a job or for something. Smile. I, I'm telling you the honest truth. And I, I've told this before, I think. But I, I met a girl or two before I ever met Karen. And, and I did what that, what, that, what that rabbit does on that movie, Bambi. I would see, what's that, what's that guy, Twitter paid him, what's his, Thumper, Thumper. I was Thumper, Thumper, Thumper. And I'd see, you know, this girl, and I'd get Twitter paid. Well, I got about be 18 or 19 years old, and boy, this, this is one girl, and I really got Twitter paid over her. I mean, I was just, you know, boy, I you know. And you know what she, she did? She called me up one day and said, me and you ain't going out no more. I'm going back to my old boyfriend. And I'll tell you, Brother Phil, my little Twitter painted heart just fell into pieces. And I'll be honest with you, it, I mean, I've been many months. That hurt. I couldn't understand thoughts of her being with him, Dean. I couldn't understand what, you know, what is about me she didn't like. Why was I rejected? I'm 67 years old now. I've been married to that woman 43 years. And I'll tell you what, I don't think a week passed about. Thank God Almighty she left and went with that other boy. <laughs> the providence of Almighty God was at work. Me and her wouldn't have made it through past Seymour. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I'm glad for the providence of Almighty God. Amen. That God providentially kept me till I met that girl right there. I don't know another woman that could have stood with me all these 43 years of all the junk we've been through. So I thank God for his providence. And young people, maybe they walked off from you. Maybe they said you was ugly. Maybe they said your breast stinks. I don't know. But thank God for his providence. Maybe you ain't never going to get married. If that's God's providential will, you sure wouldn't want to be outside it. You sure wouldn't want to be outside it. Uh, there's some things you and I can't do anything about, and we need to have peace in accepting the providence of God. You know, did you know that uh, vulcanized rubber was accidentally, accidentally discovered? They about given up, and they went and left the lab and come back next morning, and I don't know, something spilled and fell over and hit the right kind of stuff, and there was vulcanized rubber. This is what we've been trying to do. Did you know the cornflakes was discovered how to make cornflakes accidentally? They were trying to do something totally different with corn, and here come cornflakes out. Didn't do too bad, right? Telescope was accidentally discovered. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a story of providence of God. Abraham Lincoln was with, in partner business with a store with a guy named Barrett, I believe his name was. And they, and they was doing like a lot of small businesses that were going broke. So they're having a discussion one day, and he said, what are you going to do? He said, well, we can't sell it and come out. <laughs> Isn't that the way it is most times? Can't sell it and come out? And Abraham, said, Abraham Lincoln said, if we could just sell this, and I had anything left at all, he said, he said what would you do with it? He said, I'd buy me a Blackstone's Law Commentary, and I'd, I'd, I'd become a lawyer. And he said, well, you just well forget about that because I don't see that happening. Two or three days later, no wagon come up through the trail along by the store. Man and his wife, kids, looked terrible. They pulled up there and stopped and said, said uh, we're broke and we're on a journey trying to get somewhere. And said, we need to sell something for some money. And Abraham said, what do you got? He said, I got an old barrel back here. A wooden barrel. Said, we ain't got no use for it. He said, what do you want for it? He said, I want 50 cents. Abraham Lincoln said, well... He said, that's exactly what I got in my pocket. 
Chance? Providence. He said, I've got 50 cents. He said, and actually, they say Lincoln did it, not because he wanted to barrel, trying to help these folks get on down the road where they wanted to get. So we bought the barrel, they rolled it out of the wagon, rolled it across the deal there, picked it up, carried it, put it up on the, on the porch of the store. Lincoln went back in. Pretty soon he went, come back out, saw it, and he said, oh, what's in that barrel? He went over and took that deal off that seal, lifted the barrel up, looked down there, some tea, and all of a sudden he looked down, and there was a Blackstone's Law commentary sitting in the bottom of that barrel. Amen. And Abraham Lincoln said, at that moment in his mind, in his heart, and his soul, he felt like God told him, I've got something for you. Amen. Amen. And he began to study that book and became a lawyer. I'm talking about the providence of Almighty God. If we just see it and believe. In reality, there's no accidents can happen to the child of God. Whether it's a wreck or whether it's death or sickness, nothing comes with our way without the permission of Almighty God. If you'd put up Romans 8, 28, guys, I'd appreciate it. There's peace in God's providence. Maybe you had a cancellation. Maybe you had a loss, a rejection. These elections, the political climate here. You don't reckon that God's still provident, do you? Maybe a failure, a job loss. Let me just say something to you. God's providence extends to detail. Watch this verse. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints. Watch this. He makes intercession not against the saints, for the saints, according to your will. The will of God. Now keep that in mind before you jump to verse 28. Because the Spirit making intercession for us, according to the will of God, because of that, we now know that all things, not all what we think are good things, but all things work together for good, not to everybody, but to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, you want to look at the providence of God, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, and we're not even going there. We're not going that far in it, but you can, I mean, this thing rolls, okay? Let me give you some illustrations of a detail extension. I talked about Joseph early. Joseph, the details of the providence of God. Every, every move of his life, it was the providence of God just working. Then there's Moses. Do you think it just happened that Moses' his mom and dad said, you know, hey, he's a proper child. We're going to, we're, we're going to refuse to re obey the king. They took, do you think it just happened they put him in the right spot in the Nile River? Do you think it just happened the right time he cried? I'm telling you. This Bible, God, your God this morning, you came here to this church house to worship. What he wants you to know today is he's a providential God. He's interested in nations and he's interested in your life. He's interested in individual people. And the moment we decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to get in gear. I'm going to get aligned with and accept and have the peace of God about his providence. I ain't going to get shook up no more about what Twitter did yesterday. Amen. Can I tell you something? Twitter is subject to the providential power and sovereignty of God Almighty. Facebook is too. I hate to tell you, Kamala or Jezebel or whatever you want to go by, but you're under the providential power of Almighty God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you cannot escape it. Hitler thought he had her going, boy, a thousand years. Twelve years. Shot himself in a bunker. Hey, just hang around. You'll see the providence of Almighty God. Hitler said, I'm going to kill every Jew in Europe. The Jews have got a nation while he's got a tombstone. The providence of God means this, that you cannot only look at what is in front of you. You must look biblically beyond what is in front of you and believe in the providential purposes of God, the kingdom of God. Not my will, but thy will be done. He said, the, 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 thine is the kingdom and the power. He said, pray for his kingdom to come. Pray for his will to be done on earth and heaven and earth as it is in heaven. Pray because his kingdom is coming. And you're not going to stop it. 
And Congress is not going to stop it. And Facebook's not going to stop it. And Twitter's not going to stop it. His kingdom is coming. Moses. I give you something. Just go back to Abraham. 15th chapter of Abraham. God told Abraham something. He said, your descendants are going to go down into another country. Going to be there 400 years. Sounds like providence to God and me. Didn't say, well, if they want to. Didn't say that. You know what happened? The providence of God through Joseph's life. What happened? They did exactly that. Providence through Moses' life. Then he said, you're going to come out with a strong hand. God said all that before it ever happened. Before any of those people were ever born. Do you understand the kind of God you serve today? He's writing history in advance. He is performing history in your, right in your lifetime. We may not always see it. Job lived in the providence of God. Esther, the Bible said, was for such a time as this. You talk about somebody who was operating under the providence of God. Did it just happen that her uncle was Mordecai? Did it just happen that Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate when he overheard those two rascals talking about killing the king? Did it just happen that he went in and told that guy? Did it just happen that they hung those two guys? Did it just happen that the guy, that the king woke up at midnight one night and said, I want somebody to read something to me? Did it just happen he opened up the book and he started reading about Mordecai, telling about the saving the king's life? Did these things just happen? No, they were providential acts of God and the same God of Esther is the same God that you serve this morning. Providentially. Getting gear with it. Getting lined up with it. I could go on and on. God even providentially said what was going to happen to Israel. You're going to go in that land. Going to be blessed. Going to enjoy all this. But then you're going to go into idolatry. You're going to mess up. You're going to get away from me. And then I'm going to send you into captivity. Read Moses' writings in the Pentateuch. And if that's not the truth, I'll eat your dirty socks. No, I won't either. I'm not that hungry. I'm just trying to tell you through the Bible that, and now let me throw something at you. Providence of God. If you know anything about the history of the church, which has already been written in the Bible, the church, before Christ comes back, is going to be apostatized. It's going to be an apostasy. It's going to have the name that it lives, but it's going to be dead. It's going to say it's rich, but it's wretched. And you're living in that day. Did not Paul write Timothy? In the latter times, worse and worse. Perilous times. So why are we shocked? We're living in the providence of God. I've tried to rush. Did it just happen that I met Karen? I've thought about people in this church. Did it just happen that they showed up? Did it just happen? I will tell you something. The ground you're sitting on this morning, there's 16 acres here. Back in 1983, it was just considered a wasteful plot of sinkholes. Be careful where you're walking around here. There are sinkholes everywhere. You know what this is right out here where the kids all sled? That's a humongous sinkhole. We live on the San Andreas, what's that fault that comes out of? New Madrid fault. We live right on it. Crosses the highway right up here at the bridge. Be sitting here someday, earthquake come. We're sitting right on the fault. Be careful about coming to church here. I said that, brother, a sister, Barbara Hepburn one time, and she was sitting there, and I mean, she got so shook up. <laughs> Barbara got easily shook up, bless her heart. She's all right now, amen. But anyway, you are, literally are. And right over here, there's a huge sinkhole. I mean, I'm, in talk, I'm talking about sinkhole. They're all over Norwood. Sinkholes. Okay? And this piece of ground up here was a bunch of blackjack, worthless looking ground. 16 acres. Did it just happen that it became available in 1983 when we was looking for a piece of property to build a church on? You reckon? Or do you reckon God said providentially, I've got that for them. Did it just happen? Everybody else said, why, it's got a great big sinkhole right in front of it, right next to the highway. Who'd want that? We do. Anyway, I'll just say that. I will tell my family, did it just happen in 1978 that Karen and I drove up here at that old farm? Trash everywhere. Barbed wire, metal, trash everywhere. Not a good fence on that property except on Lester's side. Junked up to the core. But boy, we could afford it. 
or we thought we could. We thought we could swing it. And I look now, and I see the sovereignty of God, and I see the providence of God. You heard about the guy, didn't you, who had a horse. They were poor, needing money. It's back around Civil War time. Neighbor said, you need to sell that horse. Buy what you need to sell that horse. The wise father said, no, I don't think I'll do that. And then the stupid horse ran off. He said, I told you you should have sold that horse. Five days later, the horse comes back with 12 wild horses. Oh. He said, boy, that was pretty wise after all. He said, you don't know that. That's what the daddy said. <clears throat> His boy was trying, trying to train, break some of the horses, got thrown off and broke both legs. Neighbor said to the wise father, oh, that's bad. The wise father said, you don't know that. <laughs> Three weeks later, civil war broke out. His son couldn't go fight. <laughs> he said, well, that was turned out good, didn't it? <laughs> he said, you don't know that. <laughs> what do we know? What do we really know? We just know what God's told us. Amen. Well, I think we need to shut down. The Apostle Paul was in jail, persecuted. Providence of God? Yes. Hannah, I remember when you was going to go to nursing school and you didn't get accepted. Is that right? I know that wasn't a happy day at our house, was it? Pretty low day at our, at our house. Oh, she wanted to be a nurse. She just didn't know who she was going to nurse. <laughs> You're a nurse. But God had something different, see? Providence. You may think, boy, I didn't get to do that. I didn't get to go there. I didn't get that. Might be the best thing ever happened to you. I'm old enough now to see the providence of God in my own life. I hope that you are too. And everything that he does, we should be thankful for and humbly accept it and thank God for it. Oh, remember the pastor that got arrested? We'll tell this and let you go home pastor got arrested for passing out tracks and preaching on the sidewalk there. They arrested him, took him down to the station. He's sitting a bunch of bunch of guys, <laughs> a pretty rough bunch. Here he is with suit and tie on, you know. And, and one, of the, one of the other guys that they had picked up and were booking said, what are you here for? You don't look like our kind. I said, I was preaching down there on the sidewalk and said, they said I was violating law. Said they arrested me, put handcuffs on me, throwed me in the police car, brought me down and booking me. He said, you're a preacher? He said, yeah. He said, could you tell me how a man gets saved, go to heaven? He said, I, I, want, I, I don't want to die and go to hell. Why, well, preacher said, I'd be glad to. Led that man to Christ, sitting in that booking station in the jailhouse. Providence. Bad, getting arrested. Yeah. Boy getting saved. Good. You never know. The best thing you can do is just say, Lord. I'm going to walk in your providence. Let's stand together. I want to remind you today, I don't like what I see at all. If Biden does what he's, if he gets in, which I'm not sure that he will, providence of God could take him out. But if he gets in, he told Beto Roark down in Texas that he's going to put him in charge of getting rid of all the guns in America. There's going to be a lot of blood in the streets. This thing could get really, really bad. They seem like they're against everything that's good, right, and holy, isn't it? I don't like it. But I'm going to tell you one thing. I am going to accept, I'm going to look beyond and above them. And I'm going to say there's a providential, sovereign God. Oh, I... You talk, a guy texted me this morning, a wonderful thing. Haman was going to hang old Mordecai. And he got the king all wired up to do it, and he got permission to go build the gallows. And boy, tomorrow we're hanging Mordecai. And that night, the king could not sleep. And guess what happened? It weren't Mordecai I got hanged on them gallows. It was Haman. Oh, we got folks sitting around the United States saying, bless God, we're going to get rid of them Christians now. I'm going to tell you something. 
they ain't getting rid of our God. He's providentially, sovereignly, above all. I want you to be of good courage, okay? You may be here today and you're not saved. You've never truly been born again in the Spirit of God. Did you know the providence of God is working your life right now? And I want to encourage you today. Get in line with the providence of God and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Trust him that he died in your place for your sin. Receive him. Believe on him as your Savior today. You may be listening online, and it's just providential of God. You never listened to this broadcast before, but somehow or another you're listening today. That's the providence of God. Get in line with it. If you've never been saved, call upon him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his brother's resurrection, God to save you. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sovereign, providential care and power in this world. Help us, Lord, not to be discouraged. Help us not to be aggravated, irritated, shook up. Help us know, Lord, that there are things that cannot be shaken, and you're one of them. And so, Lord, today we thank you for the truth. I pray, God, today that as these people face their challenges and their sorrows and their pains and their losses and their disappointment and their grief, that they will remember always that I have a providential Heavenly Father Amen. who's overseeing this thing. And I'll understand it better by and by. But today I will trust Him. Amen. Lord, thank you for the Bible. For Father, without this Bible, I wouldn't know a clue about what I've preached about this morning. I'd be drifting and floating on the rotten wood of my own imagination. Thank you for your providential power. God, help these people. Help us all in the days to come to stand and having done all to stand, to fight the good fight of faith, and then rest and be at peace with the providence of God. Help us to look back and remember men like Nebuchadnezzar and Hitler, Mussolini, Tito, and other vile governments of the world that you were sovereignly in charge. You put up, you put down. No one escapes your power. We thank you. We love you today. We glorify your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray now, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And we pray thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And we look forward to that day. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you tonight. We have a, a person preaching tonight that's never in this auditorium that has never preached behind this pulpit before. And so I hope you'll be here with us tonight.